Hey everyone, we saw in our earlier uh, video example that in order to find the values of our six trig functions using the given information, we had to kind of find that missing side length in our triangle using the Pythagorean theorem. I wanted to talk a bit more about the Pythagorean theorem and how important it really is for us. The importance of the Pythagorean theorem for right triangles I think is pretty obvious. Don't need a lot of discussion there. But the connection we want to make is, well, trigonometry, our trig functions are intimately tied to these right triangles. And through this connection, we can actually also translate the Pythagorean theorem uh, for side lengths and actually write it in terms of our trig functions or trig ratios. And I think looking at the Pythagorean theorem in this version is the key to getting started in that process for making this observation, right? So here we have the Pythagorean theorem written as adjacent side length squared plus opposite side length squared equals hypotenuse side length squared. And so these are looking a little bit like our trig functions or ratios. They just don't have anything in the denominator. And so what we're going to do next is just divide both sides of this equation by one of these three quantities. And depending on which quantity we divide by, we're going to get another one of our trigonometric identities, what we're going to call the Pythagorean identities. So what I mean by that is, for example, we can make the choice to divide both sides of our Pythagorean theorem by the hypotenuse side length squared. So that's what I'm writing in right here. My abbreviation for hypotenuse, that is. And the reason why, or one of the reasons why I'm dividing by the hypotenuse is, um, well, now that we have adjacent over hypotenuse, adjacent over hypotenuse, that looks like our cosine function. So we can actually make a substitution. Adjacent over hypotenuse can be replaced with cosine of our angle theta, right? We have adjacent squared over hypotenuse squared. But we can also think of that as adjacent over hypotenuse all squared. So that really turns into our cosine squared of theta. What about that next term on the left-hand side of our equation? Well, that's opposite squared over hypotenuse squared or opposite over hypotenuse all squared. Which of our trig functions is opposite over hypotenuse? Well, that is our sine function for our angle theta. So that's equal to sine squared of theta, that second term on the left-hand side of our Pythagorean theorem equation. What about the right-hand side? Well, that's hypotenuse squared over hypotenuse squared. Hmm doesn't show up in one of our trig ratios, so maybe this was pointless. Oh no, wait, hypotenuse squared divided by hypotenuse squared, or anything divided by itself, is 1. So now we get this amazing and super important relationship between our sine and our cosine functions. Cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta is always going to be equal to 1. We essentially discovered or created this trigonometric identity by taking our original version of the Pythagorean theorem and dividing both sides by the hypotenuse squared. But we could have also divided both sides by the adjacent side length squared or divided both sides by the opposite side length squared. And what would have happened is we would have gotten a similar equation, but it would have involved different combinations of our trigonometric functions. Right, and so these three identities are what we refer to as the Pythagorean identities. The one that we use the most often is cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. But the other two versions that show up quite frequently are secant squared of theta is equal to 1 plus tangent squared of theta. And cosecant squared of theta is equal to cotangent squared of theta plus 1. Remember we discovered or derived cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 by taking our Pythagorean theorem, dividing both sides by the square of the hypotenuse, and then rewriting everything in terms of our sine, cosine, and tangent, or our trig functions. We we'll basically mimic these steps or processes for other two identities. All right, so what if we wanted to uh, derive or discover the secant squared equals one plus tangent squared Pythagorean identity instead? Well, we'd go back to the adjacent squared plus opposite squared equals hypotenuse squared equation and divide it by the adjacent side length squared instead of the hypotenuse squared. That would give us this version of our Pythagorean identity. And if we decided to divide everything by the opposite side length squared, we would have constructed, derived, or discovered our cosecant squared Pythagorean identity.
Like I mentioned, we'll be actually using these identities in practice a lot more once we start simplifying expressions and solving equations with our trig functions. But for now, we're just kind of compiling a list of them, kind of writing them down as we are able to discover or derive them. We'll be adding a lot more to this list throughout the quarter, but these are the ones that we kind of are starting with. And I just wanted to put them in a little bit of a, a neater format for you all instead of on that one example where they were spread all over the board. So our first group of identities were the reciprocal identities that said that sine of theta is equivalent to one over cosecant of theta. And remember, there's kind of two versions of each of these reciprocal identities. We can uh, swap out the position of sine and cosecant here. So that also means cosecant of theta is the same as one over sine of theta. Our second reciprocal identity was cosine of theta is one over secant of theta and vice versa secant of theta is one over cosine of theta. Just kind of move things around, solve that equation for secant of theta, and you can see it that way as well. And our third reciprocal identity said the tangent of theta is equal to one over cotangent of theta, or cotangent of theta is one over tangent of theta. After that, we talked about the Pythagorean theorem and how important it was for right triangles. We also discussed how our trig functions are initially defined using right triangles, and so putting that together gave us a version of the Pythagorean theorem for our trig functions. These are what we call the Pythagorean identities. And like I keep saying, we're going to talk about identities more and more, and we will. But an identity is an equation that is always true no matter what value theta uh, takes on or is inputted, while some equations are only true for certain values of theta. We'll go over that definition later on, but I've been using the word identity quite a bit, so I just wanted to put it out there so you had a little bit more precise of a definition. We're going to introduce the third set of identities, what we call the quotient identities. And what the quotient identities are really useful for, and there's only a couple of them, they let us write our some of our trig functions in terms of some of our other trig functions. In particular, it says that we can write tangent of theta as sine of theta divided by cosine of theta, and similarly, using one of our reciprocal identities, that means cotangent of theta can be cosine of theta divided by sine of theta. And we can go over a really quick proof of these quotient identities. We'll just do it for tangent because the same exact argument applies for our cotangent quotient identity as well. So what we know using our right triangle definition is that tangent of theta is opposite over adjacent. Right, just going back to good old SOHCAHTOA. And so we're trying to see, um, is sine of theta over cosine of theta actually equal to opposite over adjacent? Is it actually equal to tangent of theta? If we can show that that is true, then this identity must also be true. Well, let's go ahead and write sine of theta and cosine of theta in terms of our side lengths of our right triangle. Well, we know sine is the opposite side length divided by the hypotenuse. And then to avoid working with a complex fraction, instead of writing sine over cosine, I'm gonna think of this as sine divided by cosine, right, that's equivalent. And so now cosine, that ratio that we're dividing sine by here, is adjacent over hypotenuse. All right, so this is also a good little review for dividing fractions. If you ever have one fraction divided by another or a complex fraction, depending on how you write that, we can always turn that into a multiplication problem by multiplying by the reciprocal of our divisor. Or a less technical way of saying that is we just flip that second fraction over and turn it into a multiplication problem. Well, doing that step is really the key here because now we can see through this multiplication, those factors of the hypotenuse are going to cancel out. And what we're left with is in the numerator, an opposite side length, and in the denominator, an adjacent side length, but opposite over adjacent is tangent of theta. So that really proves for us that sine of theta over cosine of theta is equivalent to tangent of theta. This is also going to be one of those really useful identities that will show up when we start solving equations or try to simplify or rewrite some trigonometric expressions. Now that you've seen the basic trig identities, it's important to give you an idea of where we're going to be doing a lot this quarter with trig functions and more 
complex trig equations. And that's in taking complex trig statements or complex trig expressions and simplifying them as much as possible. In this case, we're being asked to simplify one plus the sine of theta over one plus the cosecant of theta into a single trig function. What we're going to do to do this is use our identities and then some algebraic tricks to see if that we can simplify this into an equivalent single trig function. The first thing that I always do when I am working with these is I'm going to try the reciprocal identities. And that actually will work in this case. Specifically, what I'm going to do is turn every trig function that I can see into a ratio of sine or cosine that can always be done. In this case right here, what I'm going to do is rewrite the cosecant as one over the sine of theta. Then after I've written each term with a trig function in terms of sine or cosine, I'm then going to do just a, as much algebraic manipulation as I can to simplify this. The first thing I can see is that this is a complex fraction, right? I have this quotient that in the denominator here has this fractional piece. I'm going to clear this complex fraction by multiplying by the common denominator. The only denominator here is the sine of theta. So I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the sine of theta. Doing this will clear the fractional piece down here. So I'll multiply that out. Importantly, it's to remember that when I'm multiplying, I have two terms here, so these distribute. So when I distribute this, I'm going to get the sine of theta plus sine times sine is sine squared. We write that square right here by the sign, just for the notation's sake. And then when I multiply down here, what I'm going to get is the sine of theta uh, plus one, because these signs cancel each other out. That move I just did is always a good idea, even if you have no idea where you're going, because it's gonna take the fractional pieces out of this. It's not quite obvious right now what I should do, but I'm actually seeing now, maybe what I wanna do is to factor out that, that factor of sine that I multiplied in there, if I do that in this case, so I'll factor a sine out, and so what I get is one plus the sine of theta over, and then this is the sine of theta plus one. And so again, really all I did there was undo that distribution that I did here a second ago. And actually, that works out beautifully. And actually, that works out beautifully because one plus sine is exactly the same as sine plus one. So these factors will cancel each other out, meaning that this expression right here of one plus sine of theta over one plus cosecant of theta is exactly the same thing as sine of theta. I just want to emphasize that this is just an introduction to the way of manipulating these trigonometric expressions. But this is a really important example, and you'll see more of this. Later this quarter, we're going to work up advanced techniques for simplifying these complex expressions using different identities.